you guys any movements? Yeah, I'd like to do movements. Um, Tracy's song, so I've learnt yellow, so I've told Mo, um, but I'd like to do movements, so I'd have to get the, the muscles of my arm and sure. get them to go. Yeah, uh, sounds good. I can definitely help with that. So, before we get into the, the actual meat, uh, I just want to bring up two things, both of them very good. Uh, first one is that I record the lessons okay. on video. See what you see there? Yeah. <laughs> and then I send you the video of the lesson. Oh, okay. Right? Whenever you come in, being just today or forever and ever and ever, you get them all. Okay. So, like, yeah, I've got students here who literally have now an archive of probably trying to do the math as to how long I've been doing this for. So let's say someone comes in every week. Probably a hundred lessons on video yeah. that they can always, you know, backlog and be like, how, yeah. how was I doing a year ago? Stuff like that. That's really, that's really handy to know because then you can see your progress. Yeah. Or not. <laughs> yes, that is my case. <laughs> <laughs> or not, or the lack of. But either way, it's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Like even the other day I was watching the, we were doing that here. I, I, I had a student in here and I said, you know what, let's take a look at what we were doing. I, I can recall now, you know, how far back we went, but let's say uh, last year. Um, and then surprise, and I didn't even know that. Surprise, surprise, we were actually working on the same stuff. Oh my God. It, it's not like we spent a year doing it, yeah. but we just accidentally stumbled upon the same material again yeah. 12 months later. Yeah. Not a good sign. <laughs> and he was like, oh no, but that's not good. <laughs> So that was very helpful because he kind of, in a way, gave him gave himself a bit of a of a, a call to action, right? Accountability is always a very good thing to yeah, yeah. to every now and then face. Be like, mm, okay, yeah, absolutely. twelve months have gone by and I'm still doing the same stuff. <laughs> I'm back to that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in regards to rudiments and technique in general, because for me, of course, rudiments are merely a, a tool to develop technique. Rudiments in themselves, they're just sticking, right? Like, yeah. And this is something that I always uh, say to all my students, like, why learn singles? Yeah. Why? why learn doubles? Why learn paradiddles? Why? Just for the sake of saying that you know how to play right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left? Not a good idea. <laughs> you, might just be, you might just be wasting brain if that's the only reason why, you know, one learns a parody. But if instead we understand the, the bottom line, right, the underlying concepts behind learning singles, but just using single doubles on paradiddles, which I assume you are already familiar yeah, with. Yeah, this is probably nice. So just using those three uh, uh, examples. Uh, how long besides, I know that you've got uh, grade one, but how long have you been playing for? I started at Drum Tech back in 2005, and I was having quite a similar guy to play with so for quite a I while. Know, I know that yeah. name. And Phil Elliott. And then I stopped, and a guy called Samuel Stone was getting me up to the standard of being a good trainer, which I wanted to do, and I actually paid for the course, but I had a lot of family problems, and I ended up having to move because I couldn't be a good trainer. Yeah. And I didn't play for about four years. And I went back to drum tech for a short while before um, Francis Okay. Um, but then I didn't play for years, absolutely ages. Then when I was in at uni in London a couple of years ago, I started playing again. I went to um, North, I think Northern Grammar School. I had a guy called um, Romano, uh, Luca Romano, and he got me through grade one. I met Ash, I've sang for um, Bob Marrero, he's one of my friends, for Elliot, for Tracy, for Steve White. Steve White, ah, yeah, so yeah. you've got a good I network there. I went, went to um, uh, the Cody G drum school um, group a couple of years ago, and I was, gonna, I was hoping to go this year, but I think, because I haven't played for such a long time, especially since the last one, a couple of years ago, if I go this year, this year I'm probably going to be out of my depth, because I haven't Mm. And it is hard, like play, play, it's just like a mathematician on, on drums, and it's just really difficult to do. 
I know, I know, yeah. and I, I worked with Craig with Craig Wonder once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've worked with him before. He's, good. he's got a good mind as well. Oh yeah, he's a nice guy. As a person, he's got a good mind. He's a really nice guy. Because some people, like, they, they're good drummers, they're good musicians and all that, but then you talk to them, they're not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but Craig is an interesting guy. He thinks mm. deeply. Oh, oh yeah. And inwardly. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting for me as a person. It's very good to mention. <laughs> so, going back to the idea of singles, so on and off, are we looking at what fourteen years then? On and off, yeah, five bands I've, I've been with Eric Ryan, and I heard he's got, got more. I got all my stuff on Watch Out Cause It's on for like that backup for some reason, even if it didn't do anything. Yeah. And I used to practice really quite regularly, and I had a, an electric kit at home, and then I moved it along, so I lost the kit. Um, yeah. So I haven't been able to practice properly for about a year. I always practice on keyboard. <laughs> Keyboard. I'll redo that and go back to skating again. <laughs> <laughs> there's only well, no, you never know. But there's <laughs> only one life, and you. It seems to me that you like you've um, invested a lot of time and energy and money yeah, into this. It. Enjoy it. Yeah. Keep going. Look, I, I feel your pain. I, as you can tell by my accent, <laughs> I've moved a lot. <laughs> I mean, my accent doesn't really tell the, tell you the mileage, but <laughs> it tells you that I'm not from here in the first place. So there you go. And I moved. I've moved a lot all over the world, yeah. and uh, you know, just uh, working uh, as a teacher, as a drum teacher, traveled all over, and you know, like I faced the the not not the idea of giving up or anything like that, but the the logistical challenge that it is to practice when you 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 leave as I, I'm Portuguese, you leave you leave your home country. You had I had my own practice room, my own drum set, da -da -da. you know, lovely life, right? In, in, in mom and dad's house. Yeah. <laughs> and then you move, and then you're like, you know, I'm living in a flat, I've got no drum set, because I've, I've moved, yeah. like, I'm, I'm living now, what, 20,000 or 10,000 miles away. I'm not going to ship my stuff over. That's super mega expensive. Yeah. And that's it. You're there. You, t you buy a practice pad, and that's the end of that. And I would practice, because I was teaching drums. So I had, a, I was working for a school at the time. Um, so I had access to a drum set, you know, in between lessons. Yeah. That's not really practice. No, no. You can't sit down for at least a couple of hours and just fill in one, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So it, it was tough. And I felt myself sort of regressing a little bit in certain, on certain aspects of my playing, but actually, funny enough, progressing on other aspects. Because I was becoming more of a mental practitioner. Right. <laughs> I was actually developing more interesting ideas. I was less reliant on, on technique alone. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, silver lining, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions in a second. Just to see how I can very effectively and efficiently how I can help. But before I get into that, so the singles, doubles, and thirds, what would you say if you had to describe to someone else, and this is something that it's, I find it helpful to kind of uh, organize my thinking, is I always ask myself, as I'm meditating on these ideas, like, what, how would I explain this to someone else? Singles. Right? So singles, what do you think the, the, the purpose, not what they are, I mean, right, left, right, left, yeah. we understand yeah. that, but... And that's, that's what I always say to all my students. Anyone understands right, left, right, left. Yeah. What most people overlook is why. Yeah. <laughs> so if you had to convince someone who's saying like, look, Vanessa, I don't feel like playing singles. And you're like, but I'm gonna give you the ultimate reason for why you should. What would you say? I feel like I have stick control for quite a long way. Stick control? Yeah. But I'm a very, st I'm, I'm, I'm devil's advocate now. Don't I acquire sea control practicing parody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, why should I bother with singles? It's easy, but it won't make people understand. Hand, hand stroke? Sure. Or part, uh, part of it, and they would hand, hand stroke. But you see, but, but yeah. that's, that's the thing. You're being very descriptive. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that I already knew from looking at this. 
You're not selling me. I already know that. Here's what I say to my students. Singles are not to learn right, left, and right. That a baby can do. Yeah. <laughs> what a baby can't do, or a toddler, I've got a toddler at home. Here's what he can't do. The purpose. Uh. The why behind singles, which is Singles, for me, the main purpose behind learning how to play singles properly is to develop this, to calibrate your hands in order to, so they behave the same way. Mm -hmm. Right, left, right, left, right, and you, we work on what? Evenness, steadiness of the parte. Um, again, like uh, you, you want to make sure that the movements match, right? That's the whole point of, of singles. It's to initiate that process of let's have your right not only to play the same amount of notes as your left, that, that's, okay, that's, that's a given, right? Like, but the same way, yeah. same sound, same movement, same everything, right? That's, right, for me, that's the why. You're okay. calibrating your hands. Okay. Uh, so for example, following that thread, if I'm trying to convince someone to learn how to play doubles, and, and, and I say, because I'm a very difficult student, and I say to you, you got one word to convince me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm doing the, this exercise because why? This is, these are the words that I would like you to use to convince yourself in your practice. Okay. Right? This is what I'm chasing, not that. Yeah. Right? So for doubles, what would you say that this is the, this is the thing, this is the reason at the core of learning how to play doubles? What's the, the meta skill that you are learning besides right, right, left, right? Flexibility. Flexibility. Mm -hmm. What is that, that main technique, let's call it, although it might be a weird word to use there, but the, the main technique, the main skill um, behind playing a good double stroke role, for example. There is one technique that we have to learn, otherwise we just can't pull it off, which is rebound. So if I had to sell doubles to a very difficult student, mm -hmm. and he tells me, like, now you, you can only convince me with one word, okay. right? Rebound. You're gonna acquire the skill of controlling the bounce of the stroke, right? And if the student is relatively smart, he's gonna be like, all right, yeah. I get it now. <laughs> I'm gonna go practice my. That, that's what convinced me, by the way, when uh, when I was uh, younger and uh, and I was learning drums. Uh, the beginning when I realized that my teacher was actually just making the sticks bounce on the skin and they sounded so clean and so even I was like I'm sold <laughs> so this is not what sold me okay. was that. Yeah. that the fact that he could my teacher could do this but properly right yeah. <laughs> and then finally the paradiddles for me the big meta skill behind Playing, practicing, understanding, learning paradiddles, and then using them is symmetry. That for me is the bottom line, right? We know how the paradiddle works. It is symmetrical, right? It's a mirror image almost. But um, but but a lot of people once again they without accounting for that they end up doing right left right right left right left left, but they're not trying to achieve that. So, of course, that fairly will, at the end of the day, suck. <laughs> and I see that with, with work. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So, okay. So, th that's, uh, that, that's just uh, kind of also to show how I think about learning, how I think about teaching in general. Sorry. Just got to open the door. There's another student. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so far, any any questions? Okay, so what I would like to do to kind of give me uh, and yourself as well a sense of a uh, sort of a trajectory that we can take uh, again, like I said, like I said, even for yourself, 
we've got three fields here. Usually, I, I actually do this with seven or eight different categories, but let's go for three. Just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Technique, musicality, and theme. All, all I would really want us to do here is, let's say, from one to ten, it's a self-assessment exercise, right? Like from one to ten, how would you uh, score yourself? Let's let's start with technique. One is like I'm the worst ever, can't hold a pair of sticks, <laughs> and ten I'm Buddy Rich. I'd say about five. Maybe. A five. Maybe. All right, musicality, meaning you know, like, can you express emotion? No, I'll say about three. Okay. <laughs> and then the theory, how to read them, how to understand them. Maybe okay. about seven. Uh, and that's not that's not surprising, by the way. These two numbers, well, uh, actually, all of this is not surprising. Not the numbers themselves, because I don't know you, but the distance between them, like the relationship between them. Because, of course, you know, theory is the easiest thing to understand. It's numbers, <laughs> right? It, it really is. It's the shortest, it's uh, the short-term stuff, theory. Because once you get it, you get it. That's it. Game over. There's no, there's no learning curve, per se. Or it's, it's, there is one, it's very steep, and then five things up. That, not so much, that's, that's more of a long game technique because it requires maintenance and, and, and you know, you gotta keep on feeding that, that, that monster, right? Because if you even, let's say that even you've got a killer single stroke roll, that doesn't mean that you can have a killer double stroke roll. So, right, or maybe your hands are amazing, but then the feet need work. So technique is always a, a constant. Uh, so, f and then of course, musicality, being at the peak, of the combination of these two, it's bound to be the, the one that takes the longest to reach. Yeah. <laughs> so this relationship between numbers is actually quite interesting. You have a, a gap of two in between all of them, right? Seven, five, three. Oh, interesting. Isn't that interesting how we actually know these things yeah. about <laughs> ourselves, until, but we don't know that we know them? Absolutely. There you go. So that's cool. OK, so if you were to um, Actually, before I even ask that, this immediately te tells us what, where uh, our strengths and weaknesses lie, right? So what I would focus on, looking at uh, how you saw yourself, I would focus on technique, okay. right? To develop a, a, a better control over the instrument, so you, you can bring that five or over to an eight or a nine. I think that aiming at a 10 is healthy, but perhaps unattainable. Uh, I, I speak for myself, I wouldn't give myself a 10, and I think my technique is Solid because uh, that, that's why I said like one for me is I can't even hold a pair of sticks, ten is buddy rich, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to be buddy rich, but I can still aim. Yeah. Uh, that's the target, that's fine, but I, <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll be like, hey, I'm buddy rich. <laughs> Probably not, <laughs> but uh, but there you go. Um, so I would focus on technique. Uh, so so going a little bit more in, uh, in depth. If you were to, um, we don't need a number now, but to say like hands or feet, what would you pick as your main priority? To work on yeah. feet, definitely, especially this one. Yeah, for us, yeah. For my feet, yeah. Put my right foot's open now. My, 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 my hands are producing work, so I keep working my feet. Mm, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, do, do you have a sense of why that could be? Is it the uh, inconsistent fulcrum? Yeah, I think I've, I've just held the vermin on, on very light with my grip. Okay, but, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> just as long, because my grip is fairly light. I, have, I, have a, um, I actually describe my technique often as borderline sloppy. <laughs> and what I mean by that is this, right? I always like to start, and this is a, a good thing for you to practice. As a, it's, it's a method, not an exercise. Mm. So let's say you've got uh, sort of a a spectrum. This is a spectrum for technique. And right here we have, so that's before it starts, right? Stiff. All right, so let's say that you're naturally a very stiff person. I'm not saying that you are, but let's say that that's there. It, that's one extreme over here, sloppy. Right, that's the other extreme, right? Everything is kind of just like sloppy, <laughs> floppy. There's no control. Okay, so obviously we don't want to be on any one of those ends. Logically, that, that's, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. 
But what I would do, let's say you you're learning uh, how to play a parody, or even how to to not how to play the stick thing, but you're trying to refine your technique. Okay, I would start not at stiff, obviously, but right there, which we will call rigid. So it's not stiff, but you're being very rigid about your movements, almost robotic, a little bit uh, over uh, over control in the movement. But that's exactly actually wh where I would personally start. So if I'm playing a parallel, I really like accounting for the upstrokes, the downstrokes, everything is like really metrically correct, right? So, uh, 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 uh. It doesn't work, we don't want to stay there, but we, we, we have to understand where the mechanics come from first. All right, so once that's okay, and it's respectively correct, although it won't feel right, but it will be correct, you start walking with your exercise, Towards sloppy. Bang. And eventually the, the exercise will collapse. Right? That's that's where it just becomes noise. Right? The six now are just bouncing about, like doesn't work. But that's this is a good thing because you've realized once you get there, uh, you, you loosen up, loosen up, loosen up, loosen up, collapses, cool. You reach sloppy point. That's the breaking point. All you gotta do now from there walk backwards, right, go a little bit more rigid, but very, very slowly, very, very, s it requires a lot of subtlety there. Um, and then as soon as from sloppy, you go backwards from where you came from, so you kind of already know what it, what, what it feels like. As soon as you reach the, a level where, again, the notes are correct, but it feels sloppy, it feels sloppy, but it doesn't sound sloppy, that's where you want to be, which I call to be relaxed, right? The sound's controlled, but you are relaxed. You're not trying to control it anymore. You, you've learned to let it go, but it's still there, right? And so that's why I say that my technique is usually borderline sloppy. It's right there walking the line. And I, I believe, I strongly believe this, that that's how one develops great technique. It is by trying that. Like, where, where's the tipping point where you just go sloppy? Because a lot of people stay um, within that rigid area because they, they are scared of losing control. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but one needs to let go. That's the only way. We watch those big dramas, like legendary dramas, like Buddy Rich, again, using Buddy as an example. Um, or uh, Ash Song is a great, great example as well. Guy is just loose. I, just, I, I usually call these guys like boneless drummers. Right? They just <laughs> they just move. There's no rigidity in the movement. Uh, there's no stabbing and prodding. It's just like it's a flow. It's a state of flow that's achieved. That's the only way one can find that thing. Because there's a lot. Of, some other people are a bit more on the sloppy side. Because they naturally gravitate towards that. Right? They, they can do more. Yeah. I, I see that with my students. Two beginners. Say same age, same gen, same everything. Same. One is naturally more <laughs> tense and stiff, and then the next guy, half an hour later, is kind of a floppy hands. Both those people are, of course, wrong. Right? One is stiff, the other one is sloppy. We need to find where, where it works. So with the sloppy guy, the one who is naturally sloppy, my work with with that fella is to actually teach him how to be rigid. Right? So I send him the other way. So he feels like really uncomfortable because he needs to now control everything very, very properly, very textbook, let's say. With a stiff, naturally stiff guy, I gotta teach this fella to let go. So like, for example, the exercises are completely different. <laughs> now I'm showing you a bit of the behind the scenes as a teacher's, uh, from the teacher's standpoint. What I would do, you can use those headphones there because I'm gonna make some noise here. What I do, um, with someone who's naturally stiff, by the way, where would you position yourself if you had to describe yourself? Where, where would you position yourself there? Um, more towards the rigid side because I have played for so long and I'm, I'm, I've got a few of each left in the bed. Mm -hmm. But I, I, like rigid towards the rigid side. Okay. Rigid side, not rigid. Ah, but that, that's a good place to be. 
<laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair enough. Yeah, self awareness is difficult. But but what I would do is just to give you an example. Um, what I would do uh, as a teacher, once again, right? If I see someone who is really super stiff with the movements, everything comes almost from the shoulder. I, I I've I've seen people, and by the way, completely fixable. But I've seen people who literally play with their backs. Right? They push with the back when they hit the high. For example, there's a push from the lower back. <laughs> this <laughs> stiff, right? Stiff. Everything is constrained and controlled. They can't let go. Right? There's a fear of, th there's a, a couple of things actually there, like mentally that are happening behind the curtain that kind of makes them react that way, uh, bodily speaking. One is that there's an association between playing the drums and hitting things. <laughs> so that, that uh, immediately makes them sort of go with that attitude of hitting, punching, right? Everything is a bit punchy. The other thing, still within the, the, that same sort of mindset, is that they are people, usually, who don't like to lose control. Over almost anything, situations, exercise, they are people who are very careful about the exercise, for example. Meaning, you know, you, you've heard the expression analysis paralysis? Yeah. Yes, those people suffer from that a lot. <laughs> they, just, they can't start. They become so obsessed about, like, okay, is it, okay, is it, is it? So this is going to be, and they can't start. They get stuck in that loop because everything is control, control, control. Music doesn't work like that, right? <laughs> Gotta let go. So what I teach them is the first exercise I do with these people is this. <laughs> You're going to find this ridiculous, but it's a mindset shift. I ask them to just hit the snare drum or play the snare drum, but letting go of the stick. And literally just trying to get that stick to bounce as many times as possible, as smoothly as possible on the snare drum. So basically this. <laughs> right? <laughs> it was good, right? That's it. That, but you see, you, even now you're helping with your wrist, right? The secret is that you drop and you let go. And you let the stick do the work. Perfect. Yeah. The first one, yeah, the first one we need to give it a little bit of input, but then we let go. Let it go, it's fine, that's fine. Let, let it stop on its own. E even if it goes, that's fine, let's just. But you see like, ju just as, as a little side note, but it's not a side note, it's a frontal note. <laughs> um, you see like how you're l with your left hand, you became more, you know, self-conscious of it. You started to control more, like up. But, but you, see, like, you see how, how, but these are all things that we, we decide subconsciously. I'm not even saying that you consciously decided to, oh no, I'm going to stop the stick more often. But with the l you gave your left hand less chances to actually make mistakes. Because <laughs> you kept like, no, stop, do it again, stop, do it again. Whilst with your right, you, kind of w you were more confident. Even though it wasn't 100% perfect, but you were allowing the right to actually correct itself on its own, Whilst over there you were being more dic uh, more of a dictator. Like, no, you don't do that. <laughs> so there you go. So I would agree with you. I see more of a rigid behavior there. Yeah. Right? Uh, not stiff at all. You, the, the movement, like the way you set up the movement, for example, is actually very loose. It's once you start to let go that it <laughs> gets a little bit angsty, right? Uh, normal. Perfectly normal. So that's a great exercise. If, just to give you the other side of the spectrum, if uh, the the student in front of me is more naturally kind of a sloppy, floppy, kind of a flappy hands sort of guy, you know, like <laughs> nothing's really happening, they're not actually playing, everything is kind of a drag. <laughs> then what I do with them I I is I flip it on its head compared to the, the first exercise, and what we work on is, um, you know, specific and, and very uh, measurable movements. Meaning, for example, I teach them how to play a full step. 
90 degree angle, perfect. I, I immediately, I say, whilst with the rigid fellas, I say, let it go. <laughs> with these guys, I'm like, no, no, guidelines. So we go like, you know, 90 degree angle. You're gonna strike the skin, you're gonna collect the stick, and it's gonna, ha and it has to stop exactly at 90 degree angle again. So the, whoa, the, for a guy who's naturally sloppy, that's like, oh my God, <laughs> so much counting, so much measuring. 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and then we work on simply this. Right? That, that for you is immediately very natural, right? Because you're more inclined towards control. So that for you was like, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fine. Exactly. That was fine. Anything that you can quantify, I can see that you're very okay with. Because you're not naturally on the sloppy side. You're naturally more towards... By the way, same here. I'm more naturally a guy who's towards the control. control and so w which made me sort of a stiff player at first. I had to learn over time and with guidance how to just let go, <laughs> right? And then, of course, we marry the two. It doesn't mean that because we don't play like this, right? <laughs> That's just an exercise to shift mindsets, right? To make the people who are more used to controlling things let go, <laughs> right? You're going to hit the skin and then get out of the way of the stick. For most people, that's really challenging. And most people that it l kind of uh, lean towards rigid, by the way. Uh, this is anecdotal statistics just out of the, t the top of my mind. But, <laughs> you know, because uh, well, you, you, I've taught, and this is a rough number, by the way. I don't really count how many st students I've taught. <laughs> but around, you know, I kind of do the math based on how many years I've taught and how many students per year on average I teach. So I've taught roughly like 1,500 students. So it's a sample. I've got a sample of how many people roughly lean towards rigid compared to sloppy. So there are, it's probably, a, a, it's probably a, a ratio of five to one. Five rigid per one stiff, uh, sloppy guy. Probably. If not, maybe more rigid people than that. <laughs> Maybe it's a, it's a six or a seven to one. They're, they're because most people want to control, they don't want to let go. I don't even see that as a bad thing. I'm just saying that needs to be, you know, needs to be done within reason to control things because we can over control. We can start to micromanage our own technique, and actually, we you can, we can't ever achieve full potential because we are always strangling the progress of the technique we're like no you're staying right here because right? we want to control everything and for example to play doubles if rebound isn't a technique and rebound implies let go if rebound is something that is not fully developed or at least the understanding of how rebound works physically speaking doubles will never be a thing that you'll be able to access on recall right the everything because especially doubles by the way and, and all the variants of doubles, five-stroke rolls, paradiddles. Anything that has doubles will be a problem because we, we will always be trying to, to, to strangle the, the, the rebound and make it more controllable and less, um, not random, but less, what's the word? Um, cause, and, uh, you know, cause and reaction, which is for me how I see rebound, right? Cause and then reaction, that's not me. I just set off a, a sequence of events, right? When I do this, <laughs> the only thing that I was uh, responsible for was this. <laughs> Everything else, get out of the way, <laughs> right? So someone who's a bit more into control, here's how that same exercise would sound. I can uh, do this one uh, from a place of authority because that used to be me. <laughs> That's the first one because we put a lot of <laughs> pressure I behind the first stroke. Or, and we stop it, because like, I don't know, I don't like that feeling <laughs> of the stick just moving on its own, it's weird. But once again, of course, for doubles, if this... <laughs> if that's not completely natural for you, uh, natural I don't mean initially, but with practice, if that doesn't become natural, I should say, then, you know, doubles will be difficult because for me, a double, one double, my right, is 
merely to actually do that. But once I hear the first sound, I close my fingers, I stop the sequence over there. So all I do is the same setup. My mindset is still, uh, uh, you know, thinking of. <laughs> but instead, what I do is. And I stop the click. And basically, I don't accelerate, but I know when to step on the brake. Which is a difference. A lot of people just want to accelerate. <laughs> they want to play the double themselves. Right? And sort of rest it out. Dun -dun, dun -dun, right? That's okay at a slow tempo. If you start, if you speed that up, eventually your your wrist will just be like, nope, nope, we can't do that because they can't, <laughs> right? Uh, like my peak tempo, if I'm only using my wrist, is very low. I'll, I'll tell you what it is, and I'll, I'll just keep on speeding up until it just goes totally horrible. circle that for me is why one should learn doubles to master rebound so stickings for me are just an excuse to develop techniques not the other way around technique should never be the byproduct of uh, you know learning how to play the, the, the rhythm singles or doubles or technique should be not a, it's not byproduct meaning it, it, it's it shouldn't be an accidental consequence instead it's the why and that, that's very different. It's not a byproduct anymore. It's the why. It's the foundation, right? I'm working on doubles because I want to develop my rebound control. Not, I will develop my rebound control because I'm learning doubles, which is different. It's more of an accidental thing, right? That's my philosophy anyway. <laughs> it's, it's the word why. The word why, just uh, having that as, as a, you know, as a central question. Why should I, why should I learn this or that? Not in the sense of why should I not, that's okay. We know that we have to learn it, but let's find the why. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it will be very difficult to motivate yourself to sit down and do singles or doubles or paddles for five, even for five minutes, if you don't know why. <laughs> Right, if you don't have a why, ah, oh God, kill me now, right? You'll do it for 10 seconds and move on and do something that is actually fun because that's not fun. <laughs> it's not supposed to be fun, right? That's 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 the vegetables. It's not very, it doesn't taste. I mean, uh, yes, the vegetables w well cooked and all that um, are nice. And, and, I, I, and I'm not losing myself in the analogy, by the way, because a paradiddle. Let's say a paradiddle, just to close today. Do you have any questions so far? No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close it with the paradiddle. Okay. The paradiddle, on its own, stripped of, a, 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 of any sort of uh, musicality, it's a pretty bland vegetable. <laughs> but it's useful, healthy, but not very tasty. Even besides the speed factor, like, let's say, what's a number? This is an interesting thing to, to think about. What's a number, BPM-wise, tempo-wise, that would make you be like, I love paradiddles now, but until then, it's just a chore. <laughs> 3 o'clock, 90, 90, like 90. 90 would make you feel like this is not a vegetable anymore, it yeah, sounds more like dessert. For me, it was 200. 
For me, it was. As, as I was, when I was coming up, I wanted to reach 200. Okay. When I reached, when, when, like in my mind, this was my, my thinking. When I get to 200, then I'm going to look at the parallel as something interesting. But that motivated me because I kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. You know, 120, go, go, go. Right? Over the years, guess what happened? I got there. Yeah. But here's what I realized when I got there. It's still a vegetable. <laughs> it's still a vegetable. Because here's what I didn't know when I was coming up with those crazy goals. Speed is not really what makes an exercise sweet or bland. It's really not. Right? To play a, a paradiddle, okay, I'll, I'll demonstrate. So here's the paradiddle right at uh, at 90 you said 90 i'll do it at 90 first and then i'll do it at 200. <laughs> it's not that impressive because speed is, speed is just it's time time plus relaxation <laughs> equals speed if you spend time developing relaxed movements and you build it up small increments of speed one step at a time Time plus relaxation will definitely equal high speed, right? Um, so this is 90. Uh, the click will be very clicky, because I'm going to have the 16th notes playing, just so we can hear all the notes, right? drummer I'm a drummer that's impressive but if you were I don't know I'm not not a musician <laughs> would that be impressive eh, probably not probably not probably be like okay can you play something fun because that's like sounds like a woodpecker and they have a point <laughs> that's the thing those people have a point that does sound like a woodpecker Right? So, here's what I would do instead. Come back down to, I don't know, 100 BPM, normal tempo, and practice musicality with my parody. So, I would like to close today's session with an exercise that I always challenge all my students to do. You don't have to do anything. I'll do it. You can just watch and enjoy. What I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to play a song. I'll play along to a song. I'm not going to be playing the song per se because I that's something that I personally don't really practice to play songs by, you know, I play music, right? <laughs> so I'm going to play along to the song, but here's the twist. I can only use the parody. There's a couple of more twists. That doesn't mean that I'm going to be playing a parody along to the song. That's easy. Right? No, no, I have to actually make the song sound like a song, but I can only use the paradiddle. I have to play drum beats, drum fills, all of it, only using paradiddle. You can already tell, this is not is exactly an easy, an easy rule to follow. <laughs> right? You can, you can, for an entire song, only paradiddle, only paradiddle. A couple of freedoms, liberties that I, that I, I am allowed to take, though. Number one. I can change the order of the notes in the paradiddle. As long as I keep the, the rule of right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, I can also do right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, for example. So flip it around. Or right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left. Just as long as I have a single, or rather two singles and two doubles. Let me say that again. Two singles and one double. Within the beat, I'm, I'm good. Something else that I can also do. I can play it wherever I want. Orchestration-wise, sky's the limit. 
Third liberty. I can do whatever I want with my base room. The base room will just be an accompanist. As long as I keep the pedal going up here, we're good down there. And number four, I can actually not play. So I can add rests, which it actually doesn't make it necessarily easier. Because <laughs> I'm going to be interrupting the paradiddle every now and then. And I can also change the subdivision of the paradiddle, by the way. I don't have to play at a 16th note. It can be triplets, it can be whatever I want. And once again, as long as I keep the sticking as a paradiddle. So if I do right, left, right, left, right, ah, that's singles, right? Or if I do right, right, left, left, ah, that's doubles. Stuff like that. All right, so... Do you know a band called Tower of Power? You're gonna love this song. All right, wish me luck.
Exactly. This is why I brought it up. This is why I brought that up, right? I wanted to showcase, like, look, these are not just rudiments. And to to overlook uh, the why, the purpose, the, the use as well, is to miss out <laughs> on a world of possibilities. <laughs> and the same goes for all the other rudiments, by the way. The other 40, the other 100, the other 1,000. All of them have all this hidden information inside of them and so many people s only see them at face value and i always like to be like for me like learning the drums is about squeezing juice out of a you know out of an orange squeeze 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 and then you always keep on find another drop and they keep on coming as long as you squeeze yes at first the first squeeze you know pours a lot of juice out of the Afterwards, you need to squeeze a bit harder, right? Because it gets more difficult to extract more information out of, out of a simple eight-note long sticking. Yeah. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. That's a paradigm. So in order to do that, you're going to have to squeeze a lot. <laughs> exactly. You can do a lot. And the, the good news is, that didn't come from a uh, sort of uh, blissful inspiration. That came from, b which is a good thing, because some people might say, like, I don't know, I just come up with stuff. Not my case. Everything for me, everything that you just saw there is acquired knowledge. Meaning I practice this stuff. Like, I, I, I developed systems in order to access this information. And then the more information I accessed, the clearer, uh, the clearer I, I could see the system, wh what the method was. And now I share that method with my students, right? Like we go from that, right, the boring stuff on the, on the practice pad or the snare drum, how do we get to what I just did? It's not that, again, it's time, but in, term, in terms of content, it's not like high-tech stuff, rocket science, quantum physics level of stuff. It's really not. But it's knowing the steps. If we don't know them, yeah, we can't get there, right? If we don't know the root, then that's definitely what I do for my students. I show them how to squeeze the orange. It's funny because, you know, I use these expressions, but my students start to adopt my lingo. So the other day, one of my <laughs> students sends me a, a message with a video sh of him practicing, which I, I encourage all my students to do. Send me videos of you guys practicing because I want to see it. I, wanna, I don't want to wait a week to correct what could have been corrected on the day. Send me a message with a video, right? And I watch it. I'm like, eh, eh. left hand needs this, right hand needs the other, or... It's awesome, keep going, right? He sends me, he sends me a video, this guy, of him practicing, and then the caption said only the one word, squeezing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> there you go. That's what I've got for you today. My pleasure. Ends up being, uh, being almost an hour. Sorry? It ended up being almost one hour. Oh, my God. Yep. I got, I got excited.